Hello there, my very good friends. Andy Murray here for What Culture Wrestling. And now that AEW Dynamite is a very real thing and not just a theoretical thing, I want to talk to you guys about one of the things that AEW does very, very well. They've been doing it really well on pay per view, and now it's coming across on television as well. And that is taking trash and turning it into treasure. First, a note on the word trash before I dive in. Obviously, that's a very incendiary term. It's a very strong term. And when you throw it at something, it sounds really harsh. So what I'm not doing here is telling you that these things were straight up garbage. Really, it's all a matter of perception. I'm going to look at a few things that weren't exactly thought of very highly by the general wrestling consumership, I guess, and run down how AEW have taken them and polished them. So let's dive in. So with that description in mind, earlier this year, Dean Ambrose in WWE was basically considered trash. Ambrose was coming off what will probably go down as one of the most mishandled WWE returns ever, and his fortunes were so grim that he was giving credence to that old bollocks about the Royal Rumble curse. He entered at number 13, he told Vince McMahon he was buggering off, and then suddenly, a few weeks later, he was being embarrassed by Nia Jax, of all people, on television. Very suspicious timing on that one. And of course, this all came after a program with Seth Rollins in which he blamed Roman Reigns for his own leukemia diagnosis. That was a line that that man had to read on live TV. Now, there were occasions when Ambrose worked hard on television to try and make WWE's own trash into treasure, but there were noticeable dips in his in-ring performances. And here's another example for you. Ty Dillinger earlier this year was considered trash by many a pro wrestling fan and indeed his own company, who had basically done nothing with him for almost a whole year. They just kind of banished him to the house show loop, only coming on TV every now and then to get abused by someone like Randy Orton. Really, in the dying months of his WWE tenure, Dillinger was made to be just as useless as one of Vince McMahon's creative writers. But here's the thing about those writers. Vince at least acknowledges their existence. He comes in every week and he tears their work up. He knows that they exist. But Dillinger? I'm pretty convinced that he just kind of forgot about the guy for a whole year and then realized he was still paying him money, cut him off the payroll. That's how worthless Vince thought Ty was. He basically releases nobody these days, the days of mass cuts are over, but he got rid of this guy. And here's a third example for you, Jack Swagger, whose name had been considered trash for years. After an MIA spell in WWE of his own, Swagger was released from his contract in 2017. And it's safe to say that the ensuing indie run didn't exactly set the world on fire. It almost seemed as though Swagger had just completely lost interest in wrestling. He just really wasn't showing up anywhere of note aside from the odd blip every now and then. And on the UK indies, which was still a pretty lucrative and thriving market at the time, he became something of an in-joke for his awkward promo delivery, something that was never his strongest point in WWE, I think it's fair to say. Now, he was in Lucha Underground as well, but Lucha Underground's popularity peaked several seasons ago, and now, at this stage, I don't think the promotion's ever coming back. It wasn't a strong run. But now, in October 2019, John Moxley, Sean Spears, and Jake Hager have all made significant waves during AEW's improbably popular launch period. But how the hell have they done it? Let's look at Moxley, who debuted in a believable, captivating brawl with one Kenny Omega at the end of the Double or Nothing pay-per-view back in May. Targeting Omega immediately put Moxley over as a major disruptive force, and the brawl was really believable in that Moxley had to work for it. He didn't just go in there and straight up shellac him right away, he had to work for that DDT because Kenny Omega, tired as he was after the Chris Jericho match, still had some fight in him. But of course, Omega's ability to counter waned as his own fatigue and Moxley's bloodlust set in, and by the end of it, he was thrown off a massive pile of poker chips, wasn't he? And what AEW did there was bet on Moxley's own ability to restore his own aura. It paid off almost immediately, and Moxley was suddenly the hottest name in American wrestling. And on top of all of this, this nuanced angle got two things over without completely nuking Omega. The first was, of course, a match between the two, and the second was that it established Moxley as a star. Two birds, 
one stone. Okay, so next, let's take a look at Sean Spears versus Cody. Now, if you'd pitched a storyline like that even six months ago, I think a lot of people might have laughed at you. But look how well the damn thing turned out. It turned out to be a tremendous piece of long-term business and it started by acknowledging the past between the two, those years spent in the WWE training system. And of course the AEW chapter kicked off when Cody famously referred to Sean Spears as a good hand and a potential player coach in that interview. This motivated Spears to crack Cody with that controversial chair shot at Fighter Fest, and after that, we got his reveal of his motivations in a sit-down interview with Jim Ross, and of course his new mouthpiece, Tully Blanchard, who throughout the whole thing was really outstanding. Old school in mentality and the way it employed history, this storyline arc and the way it portrayed believable animosity enabled the suspension of disbelief. It turned out to be an outright blood feud with big attention to detail. AEW didn't just have Spears come out and do his goofy ten shtick, no. They put great time and great effort into saying to you guys, hey, this guy's a big deal and you're gonna believe in him. And people did. And admittedly that Sean Spears is a bit of a fanny on social media certainly helped matters as well. That showed that he could probably play a convincing heel. And in AEW, he's been given the platform to fly. Now he ended up losing to Cody at All Out, and you know what, that's fine, because Cody at this stage is the most over guy in the company and pretty much their ace. But, we're being honest here, Spears, I don't know, 8 out of 10 performance, he was very, very good, was a win itself, and kind of ironic given how tired the 10 thing had become in WWE. And on to the final piece of our puzzle, Jake Hager, who's Dynamite debut was just the damnedest thing, wasn't it? This was a performer who in WWE, despite winning a world title, was never really a star, but he really came off as one at the end of Dynamite. And when you consider what happened in the build up to that, that's quite remarkable because when the rumours of Hager signing did the rounds on the internet, the reaction was largely one of mockery. People were like, hey, they're signing Jack Swagger, it's TNA 2.0, it's a joke. This guy is going to drag the company's credibility down. But it didn't. It came off really well. Hager had a shirt on, but the guy looked absolutely ripped, and he's had himself somewhat legitimized by his brief MMA run with Bellator. And when he charged in there, when he clobbered Dustin Rhodes with a forearm, when he hit that awesome athletic Vader bomb, he just looked like a beast. He was angry, he was intense, he was legitimately fired up. He looked absolutely massive in there. And that's not just because of his presence or his immense physical size, because he's huger than most people in AEW, but because of the choice of victims, Cody and Dustin Rhodes. Now Cody, of course, is the star, and Dustin, as you learned from that massive pop, I honestly thought it was CM Punk coming out on the first episode of Dynamite, Dustin is the sentimental favourite. And in one stroke, AEW established Jake Hager as a top level heel worthy of both fear and loathing. This was a perfectly booked angle, it was a perfect introduction, and the moving parts came together with logic, excitement, heat, and precision. And topping this off, Dustin, who was someone that WWE decided wasn't worth keeping around even as a veteran presence, looked brave and honourable as he came out and tried to stop the beatdown. Hager, meanwhile, looked like an absolute killer. Cody, well, he looked like he'd been absolutely murdered. He was the perfect guy to choose as a victim to make Hager look great on night one. Almost immediately, the Jack Swagger stench was gone. So that's three big examples of AEW taking someone else's trash and turning it into pure treasure. But what, you might ask, is the secret behind all this? It's audacity. Audacity meshed with an old school mentality of promoting and storytelling that has been missing from wrestling for a long, long time. What the AEW are doing here is they are taking faded stars and immediately reheating them by presenting them as big deals on their first appearance. It's working so far, but it is an ambitious approach and it is one loaded with risk. I mean, look, they closed out their first TNT broadcast with Jack pissing swagger but it's because of their conviction that it works. All of this ties in with the recent narrative, the idea that angles, not matches, will win the Wednesday Night War. Now at the moment, AEW, just like Cody's fond of saying himself, are doing the work. 
over in NXT, the writers and the creative staff are asking the audience to do the work for them. And look, I know NXT is a sacred cow, it's everyone's favourite WWE show, mine included, but that doesn't make it immune to criticism. Criticism should always be allowed when it's constructive. So with that in mind, I've got some for NXT. In NXT's first three weeks, if you look at the viewership, they had a week to week decline. They did not grow their audience, they did not retain their viewership, even when unopposed. I think this is because the formula is a little too basic and the presentation of their big angles is just a little bit too contrived. And you guys, if you're watching this, know the formula I'm speaking of. A star wins a big hard fought match, but they barely have a moment to celebrate because oh no, it's the entrance music of someone who's been missing a little while or one of the most over stars on the roster and we're gonna have a stare down. It's a very, very simple, basic angle, but one that works every now and then to be perfectly fair. And on commentary, you've got Mauro Ronaldo putting in a lot more effort than creative to get this thing over with that excellent combat sports voice that he has. And you know what happens next, a challenge is either hinted at or made, the people involved just kind of stare at each other, there's no real physical activity, you might get a couple of words, and that's it. And like I say, sometimes this does come off really, really well, but it's also quite hollow when you think about it. NXT aren't really telling stories here, they're just putting two people in the same place and kind of asking you to join the dots yourself. So essentially, what they're doing is they're not booking storylines, they're not really booking programs in these moments, and they're not really booking matches. They're booking match graphics. We've already seen it several times on the NXT on USA Network era. Here's a couple of them. We've got Shayna Baszler versus Candice LeRae. We've got potential match between Adam Cole and Finn Balor. And of course, the other one on that episode that kicked off the Wednesday Night Wars, Adam Cole versus Tommaso Ciampa just to name a few, but there's another formula as well, the one-sided beatdown that results in a future match. For that, we've got Matt Riddle versus Adam Cole, and more recently, Damian Priest versus Pete Dunne. Now, these things are absolutely effective in laying a foundation, but you can't base an entire storyline around something so, so one note. And that is why, at this stage, NXT, despite boasting an arguably more talented roster and, if we're being honest, probably the bigger names, that's why they're not ruling the roost over to AEW. Aside from, you know, maybe Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, those NXT wrestlers are definitely more critically acclaimed. And that leads me to another point here. AEW is often said to be reliant on Dave Meltzer, on his praise, on his promotion. But increasingly, it doesn't look like AEW are the promotion going for that acclaim. If you really sit there and pick apart the in-ring products of these two competing brands, increasingly, it feels like NXT are the ones shooting for star ratings. Contrast with some of AEW's most memorable moments so far, we got Jon Moxley, his return at double or nothing, stirring genuine emotional euphoria. He was a free man, he was back, he was rebuilding himself. And that had nothing to do with star ratings and critical acclaim. And whether you agreed with the spot or not, the same can be said for the disgusting outlaw chair shot that Cody got hit with by Sean Spears at Fighter Fest. And hey, on top of that, we got the same feeling when Dustin Rhodes, good old Dustin Rhodes who everyone loves, was clobbered down by Jake Hager just the other week. Expression, emotion, creativity. It's an old song, but one that AEW is playing with soul. NXT, on the other hand, are like an impressively noodling guitarist, a Steve Vai. It's ridiculously impressive, it's technically excellent, but it's also kind of soulless. It's kind of hollow. Anyway guys, that's it. My take on the matter is done and now it's time for yours. So head on down to the comment section below and fire off those spicy hot takes. I know you probably will anyway, but you know, go ahead and do the thing. Once you've done that, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Then you can follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and if you want to tell me how wrong I am, you can find me at AndyHMurray on Twitter as well. You'll have a great time if you do that. Bye!